the island of Spitsbergen is the starting point for expeditions to the North Pole, a little over a thousand kilometers away. In early November, there's next to no sunlight. Each day, what little light remains continues to dim. In just 10 days, the sun will stop rising above the horizon altogether. The long Arctic night will begin. It'll be pitch black, like it is on the mainland in the middle of the night. Just black sky and stars. The locals say there are three, not four, seasons here. Day, night, and snowmobile season. There are no indigenous people on the island because of the harsh environment. But a very small few have chosen to live here. Shall we go home? Yes. My legs are frozen, just like my fishing line. Be careful. In mid-November, the Arctic night descends on the archipelago. To greet it, the Norwegian town of Longyearbyen organizes a special ceremony. For many years, the archipelago was declared terra nullis, or land belonging to nobody. It wasn't until 1920 that the islands became Norwegian territory. But even today, they enjoy a unique status. Any country that signs the Spitsbergen Treaty can freely engage in commercial activity here. No visa is needed to visit the island, and there are no customs or border posts. Anyone on the planet can come and settle on the archipelago. There's just one condition. They must be self-sufficient. This uh, place is so special because a lot of people came here and they really didn't know where they really are. Because they think, OK, now we are closer to North Pole. Yes, we are. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people go out uh, and have a fun, you know, with scooters and everything. But uh, time to time, the weather changes very fast here, like very fast. This area is, could be very bad mm -hmm. if you are not lucky. About 2,500 people live on the island, but knowing the number of bears is more of a challenge. There are at least 3,000, certainly more than there are people. I'm a uni student here, and uh, if I would like to go like somewhere else than just Longyearbyen, mm -hmm. uh, would I need to bring a rifle? Where would I need to bring a rifle? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, we re recommend everyone to, to bring a rifle out in the field as far back because of the, the bear. Have you ever encountered a polar bear yourself? Oh yeah, many times. Yeah. Hiring a rifle here is as easy as hiring a scooter. But if a bear gets shot, the investigation into whether it was really killed in self-defense is as thorough as it would be for murder. The island is indeed an unusual place. Shops provide special lockers where customers can store their guns while shopping, and wild deer amble freely in the streets. There's a distinct Russian spirit in this small Norwegian town. Only two countries currently maintain a presence on the island, Russia and Norway. This is uh, Maria Hola. from uh, Copenhagen. Hi, uh, Maria. She's out here visiting. Oh, hi, Ola. Yeah, we're just going to Croa, Croa. actually. Yeah. yeah. Because uh, they have some Russian roots. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, watch the yeah. Lenin statue. These people took an interest in the Russian language for a reason. They often visit the town of Barentsburg. For decades, the neighboring towns have shared visits for sporting events. We may be different in many aspects, but I'm sure everyone's happy to have a neighbor. You see, there are no other neighbors around here. And we've had a lot of enjoyable meetings in Barentsburg.
Are you leaving for work? Yes. Do you have a regular working day? Of course not. It's a holiday today. A holiday? There are no holidays in the mine. Two years ago, Maxim Dubov came to Spitsbergen alone to see how it would work out. Many people can't bear being separated from their relatives. Not everyone manages to move their families here. Not everyone can cope with the atmosphere in this Arctic night. He left his wife and three children at home. We didn't feel anything for the first six months. Then mum started missing dad. And so did we. He wasn't there. And we could only talk on Skype. He had to call me every day as soon as he was home from work. Knowing that he was safely back from the mine was the most important thing for me. Two months ago, the Dubov family at last moved to Barentsburg. I'd like to spend at least 10 years here. I want to settle properly and save enough money to buy flats for my kids. Are you doing your homework? Yeah, in a bit. Hello, Mom. Hello, son. I haven't seen you for ages. So, does it feel better having your family with you? Do you need to ask? You must feel more like real man. Yes. <laughs> In the past, Barentsburg was always a male domain, not a place for women, let alone children. Men still account for the majority of the population. There are no old, sick or socially disadvantaged people here. Every inhabitant of the island has to be young and healthy enough to be able to work. My grandfather worked here in 1956. He spent two years on this island, and Dad always dreamed of going where his own father had worked. He came in 2008 with my mom, and in 2009 my wife and I came here too. I'm the head of the tourist agency and the hotel administrator. That's part of my job description. Although it's my wife's job to deal with a male, that rests on my shoulders too. It's not difficult, so why not? During tourist season I also work as a guide. And when we have excursions I work in the souvenir shop. In the morning I teach English at the local school, which is why I'm not in the office. There's only one employer in Barentsburg. Arctic Coal is a Russian state-owned company. Everything in the village, the houses, shops and canteen, all belong to the firm. People can only get to Barentsburg once every two months. Olga and Slava are both cooks. They decided on their life change after a wedding anniversary. Stepanida has brought her two children to be with her husband. Yelena has come alone. Come without her husband? That's a first. About a year ago, another woman came on her own. She left pretty soon, though. She was an accountant. Usually it's the other way around. Women come after their husbands, and men try to find jobs for their wives on the island. New arrivals gather beside the personnel department. Stepanida brings her children with her. There's no one else to babysit because everyone is at work. Arctic Coal also owns a productive mine, the Barentsburg. Everyone has to attend a briefing when they first get here. Stepanida is going to work at a sauna. She'll start as soon as her children are going to kindergarten. But first, they have to get used to their new home. 
The kids started whimpering and I decided to leave so we wouldn't disturb anyone. It's always dark outside, so I'm constantly sleepy and my eyes hurt. But I'll get used to it. Other people cope somehow, so will I. We'll wait for the light. I hope we'll settle here. We'll like the place. Now the main thing is for the kids to adapt to the climate and be healthy. The first contract is usually for six months, the second for two years. On average, people have spent four to five years in Barentsburg, but that seems to be changing. Workers are now spending longer periods of time here, renting furnished apartments. And so the Arctic Coal Trust is renovating many of the houses. And was there a TV set? Yes, so there. It's so nice. Just great. Everyone likes this place. It's nice and tidy. New residents meet up at the home supply store. Everyone has a long shopping list. A small pan. A bucket. I think our first two paychecks will be spent entirely on the household. Number one, two, and the third one as well. There's no cash on Barentsburg. In 2011, there was an attempt to introduce a local currency called the Bon. But Norwegians were unhappy about the idea of banknotes circulating on Norwegian soil with the Russian Federation printed on them. It's rumored that to avoid conflict, the government's decided not to use any money at all. And normal bank cards don't work here either. The shops only accept a special internal card, which is given to all Arctic Coal's employees. Everyone sets their own credit limit, and the balance is eventually deducted from salaries. It's easy squirreling money away because there is nothing to spend it on. No restaurants or discos. I'm sure that if we do manage to live here for some time, we'll be closer to each other. But my uncle told me about people leaving their husbands and wives for other men and women. It must be an island of temptation here. <laughs> to kindergarten, my daughter asks me, Mom, it's still dark, where are we going? It will always be dark now, I tell her. The sun has gone to sleep. She says, I want to go home. I don't want to live by the sea. She thought it would be warm and sunny. There are now 430 people in Barentsburg, including 130 women and 55 children. No one is ever born on the island. It's against the rules and pregnant women must return to the mainland. Spitsbergen children never catch colds. The virus can't survive here. It's only the newly arrived who bring infections to the island. That's why children are always quarantined for their first 10 days, when they can't go to school or kindergarten. Sometimes, though, children just can't adjust to the climate. Their parents either have to send them away or leave the island for good. It's too cold to go outside, so the kids wrap up to play in an unheated hall, where they can exercise without being exposed to the elements. Even though the temperature is almost the same as outside, the kids are protected from the biting Arctic wind. Okay, sit yourself down. Okay, well. Oh, aren't you getting heavy? 
No, I'm not. Daniil is the only seventh year student. His brother Vasily is in the first year, but all the students sit together in one classroom irrespective of age. The teacher gives each student individual assignments and then checks them separately. After classes, the children stay in school. There's nowhere else to go, and the teachers always try hard to find new ways to entertain them. I've realized why running is more difficult here. The air pressure on the island is higher than on the mainland, and it's more difficult to breathe. Sometimes I ask myself if a normal life would make it easier for him in the future. I still don't really know. I'm not sure if we've made the right choice. Although the Spitsbergen coal reserves are being depleted, to continue mining is a matter of principle. A presence on the archipelago is a political imperative for both Russia and Norway. The mine works around the clock, so the adults work in shifts. They often leave as early as six in the morning, leaving Daniel to wake the younger kids. When the alarm clock goes off, I wake Marina and Vasily. They want to stay in bed. It's still dark. Where are we going, they ask. I brush Marina's teeth and Vasily does his own. Then I put the kettle on and dress them. When I grow up, I'll move to the mainland and go to university. I want to be an interpreter. They make good money. And it's always good to know a foreign language. The most important event in autumn is the annual sports competition. People from the Norwegian town of Longyearbyen visit the Russian Barentsburg to attend. It's a tradition that dates back many years. Some say it began as early as the 1930s, when both Norway and the then Soviet Union were still new to the archipelago. The Norwegians taught their neighbors their traditional game called bandy. We'd never even seen a stick before. When we started playing, we didn't know the rules and we were constantly asking questions. Now we've got the hang of it. They have won once. Oh. Yeah, they won over us, but uh, usually we are, are the best team. <laughs> of course, in I think we're on equal ground. We're good at volleyball and always win at basketball. We're about even in football and as for chess, We've got a new player who will bring us victory. All the competitions are held simultaneously. Winning is a matter of honor for both countries especially when it comes to football and bandy. Only twice in the competition's history has the Barentsburg team beaten the Norwegians at their national game. The second time was last year. But fortune wasn't to smile on them this time. The football had the fans on the edge of their seats, with the teams neck and neck. In the end, though, the Russians proved victorious. I lost two games and won one. And I played with Dan and won that as well. There's my boy. Did you win over Dan? He did. Clever boy. 
surprisingly, the basketball game is the most dramatic. The Norwegians are less than happy with the referee, and one spectator is quite indignant. Do we need a ref at all? No referee? You can't do without a ref. Will you referee? Let him do it. Will you do it? Let him referee. Give him a whistle. Go over there. There'll be two of you. Go on. So two referees take to the court. The people of Spitsbergen do know how to compromise. There are more than 40 different ethnicities living together on the island. Northern life demands tolerance and cooperation if it's to be survived. Thank you. The sporting event is one of the very few opportunities people have to socialize and meet up, especially during the long Arctic night. You work here? And you just visit? And you? No, go walking. Working also? I but saw your games. So. You saw my games? No. Okay. <laughs> In table tennis? Or football? Football. 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 Okay. Yeah. yeah. That yeah. was good. It was good. But you guys won. <laughs> Barentsburg is now making ambitious plans to develop its own tourist industry. The abandoned mining town of Pyramida will be home to the new Russian tourist center. And there's no people there, so it's kind of like a ghost town. There was one guy uh, named Toby who also lived in Longyear being with us. He tried to go for a hike to, to Pyramiden. It took him like two weeks and he had to, he had to, get, to, uh, to get picked up by Susselmanen because he had no more food left. <laughs> so <laughs> I think you should only do it if you have a snow scooter. Yeah. yeah. But it can only be reached in daylight and the navigation season is already over. When the polar night ends and the snowmobile season begins, the archipelago's Russian sector will be teeming with people. Tourists. They like watching us locals picking up the kids from school. The guide probably tells them we're the natives. <laughs> we have to say hi and smile. We go to work or come home, go shopping or just walk, and they're gawking at us. And we stare right back. But that won't happen until the polar night ends and the northern sun has risen again. For now, people only venture away from the settlement for emergencies, perhaps to repair vital and hard to reach equipment. No one leaves the village without a very good reason. Usually, people only leave the village to admire the beauty of Spitsbergen Island. But what can they see at night? Nothing. There's absolutely nothing to see. During the long polar night, the residents tend to live ordinary, workaday lives. New arrivals are given time to get their bearings, but today is Olga's first day at work. I was anxious, of course, to do everything on time. But I managed. It's fine. Her husband only starts work tomorrow. He's here now to support his wife. We're going to spend at least two years here. But we'll have to see how it goes. Two years is a long time. Maybe six months will do it. Before starting to work independently, Yelena will shadow a colleague for a few days. I have a boyfriend, but I'm not sure if he'll come here. 
Stepanita's children couldn't start at kindergarten because one of them has a cold. Only time will tell if he can cope with the climate. Marina, behave. I don't like it. And tomorrow you go to kindergarten? No. Yes. No. And let's brush your teeth. The weather is awful. Look how strong the wind is. And it's so dark. And it will stay dark until the next Arctic day begins.